Today is April 9th, 2021. My name is Angelica Diaz and I am interviewing Cesar Moreno for the University Library Special Collections and Archives at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, hereby abbreviated as UTRGV. This project is in partnership with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Mr. Moreno, that this interview will be placed in the University Library Special Collections and the Archives at UTRGV and shared with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. The University Library Special Collections and Archives will archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation you are willing to share. UTRGV University Library will retain copyright of non-exclusive right to the interview and any other materials you donate to special collections and archives UTRGV. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting to make sure you agree to the interview procedures before we continue. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say yes, I agree or no, I do not agree after each question. Are you ready? Yes. Do you give University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your materials at the UTRGV University Library? Yes, I agree. Do you grant UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest in copywriting over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes. Do you grant the University Library Special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voices of a Pandemic Oral History mini project? which will include posting the interview on the internet. Yes, I agree. As you recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form. We used information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure VOSA server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before VOSA sends in UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives, we would like to have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible to UTRGV University Library. The final two questions ask for your consent on what I just described. Do you wish to share the rest of, the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at UTRGV University Library Specialist Collections and Archives? Yes, I agree. On occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and VOSAS receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I agree. Thank you for your consent. Your experiences and stories mean a lot to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives. I look forward to what you say in the interview questions I will now ask. Cesar, thank you for your time. Like I said earlier, your stories and experiences are valuable to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and the VOSAS project, particularly, particularly for us at the UTRGV Special Collections, we are committed to preserving the stories of Mexican Americans and Latinos from South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley and those who work closely with these populations. During this COVID-19 pandemic, because you have firsthand experience of potentially being exposed to a deadly virus by working at Panda Express at the beginning of the pandemic, and because you are a son, brother, and a friend who is knowledgeable of how COVID-19 affects people within your inner circle. I know you have many meaningful stories to share on how COVID-19 has impacted these roles you carry out in life. So before we begin, can you please tell us who you are 
as a person? Who is Nazar Moreno? Uh, I mean, I'm currently 21 years old. My hobbies include, I mean, I like playing soccer a lot. I like playing soccer and watching soccer. My favorite team right now must have to be Bayern Munich. But yeah, those are my, I don't really do much. I just go to work, uh, go back home, watch some anime and just try to relax as much as I can. Uh, but I mean, I like hearing music a lot. I can't draw to save my life. <laughs> what else? What else? I think that should be all. It's really not that much about me. <laughs> okay, so for this first section, I will be asking about your personal understanding of COVID-19 and the first encounters. Mm -hmm. okay. To begin with, when did you first hear about COVID-19? How did you learn about it and when about it when it became widely known? When I first heard about it, it must have been while I was working at Panda, Panda Express. Yeah, I remember working a shift and my manager named Marshall was freaking out because he's saying that there was, he was talking about the case and I heard a little bit about it, but I didn't pay much attention to it because I was like, okay, well, well, what are the odds of it actually hitting over here? And you know, I mean, look at us now. <laughs> We've been in quarantine for like a, almost a year, almost for like a year and a half. But yeah, he, he was making a big deal saying that if it were to uh, ever be encountered here in the valley, we would have to close the store, wash our hands like 10 times, have to like take a bunch of safety procedures, wear our masks. Yeah, it was just a crazy time. What was your reaction when you learned about the seriousness of COVID-19? <laughs> The reaction, like, oh, it's it's real. Like, this is a real, like, this is a real emergency. We have to take care of each other. We have to be careful, like, who we talk to, who we encounter to. We, I mean, there's a bunch of safety procedures that we had to take. But, I mean, we learned from the better. At what point did you realize that this pandemic was a serious life-altering event? Or do you think the opposite? Why? Uh, life altering event. I mean, it did impact us like a lot. It didn't, it wasn't something like small that would, oh, how would I put it? Mm -hmm. Like something that would go away just easily? No, I mean, it hasn't gone away easily as we can, we're still, we still here. I mean, at first we did enforce it to wear our mask and to to be six feet away. But I mean, now that it's been a year, it's like everything's we're we're normalized by wearing face mask and like six feet apart, staying away from each other is nothing anymore. We we like we know the the virus exists, but we still we we just since everybody's okay at the moment, they they think it's okay. All right, over the last few months, what news media, social media, or other resources did you rely on to keep you informed about the coronavirus? <laughs> I would always watch the CNN uh, broadcast. CNN, I would always watch them. Can you share with me what you understand about COVID-19 as an infectious disease and any of its variants? Likewise, can you share with me what you don't understand about this new coronavirus? Like, I know, like, I don't know fully what it is, but I heard most of, like, the symptoms of what it does and how it could affect you. But I really don't understand how they still can't find a cure for it. That's the only thing that I don't get. Since if we're really pushing forward for it, like for a cure, why can't we find like a real, real cure instead of just getting like these vaccine shots? That would be the only thing that I don't understand. Cause we don't know the vaccine shots work 100% since it's been ups and downs.
can you tell me what you know about the carries vaccines available to the public? How do you feel about these vaccines? <laughs> as I just said, yeah, as I just said, it's, we don't know if they might work or not. This is basically us taking it like a 50-50 chance. Like, honestly, we're risking it, but I mean, if it works, it works. Amen, right? But if it doesn't, we might just get exposed to it and might just affect us even worse. Do your family members hold the same beliefs as you about COVID-19 or are there some who take it more seriously or lightly? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time, please? Uh, do your family members hold the same beliefs as you about COVID-19 or are there some who take it more seriously or lightly? I would say that we take it we take it seriously. Like we we know what this disease is, we know what it can do to us. Uh, but we don't. Every now and then we like to to joke around about it, so we can stay positive because too much negativity is always bad for us. Uh, but we joke around like, oh, these COVID jokes and stuff. But I mean, we know the seriousness of this of this um, disease. I'm sorry. Uh, but we we take it serious, like we wash our hands, we still wear a face mask, we still try to stay six feet apart. Even though we like currently we're I'm working in landscape irrigation, I still wear my mask whenever I talk to customers. Like it's the same thing. We're we're taking the same procedures. And finally, do you have a vaccination story you would like to share with me now or perhaps later in this interview? vaccination story i have not i currently just got the applications to so to for the vaccine shot i haven't turned it in though <laughs> so i haven't taken the shot but i've been hearing like a bunch of good stuff and bad stuff about it so i don't know whether to actually go for it like get the shot or if i should mm, uh, wait it off and actually wait for a cure to for the next set of questions, I'd like to talk about how you have seen COVID-19 affect family members, friends, and equal important, how it affected what you could and couldn't do during the first half of quarantine. Okay. Says that you currently live at home with your parents, two brothers, sister, and a cousin. How was quarantine like for the first two weeks in March and April of 2020? Were there any memorable moments you would like to share? Uh, <laughs> I would just, uh, every time I remember the beginning of quarantine, I always remember my mom spraying us with Lysol everywhere, like from head to toe. Every time we'd come from somewhere, she'd be like, okay, no, you're not entering the house yet. And she would get the Lysol and spray from head to toe, head to toe, make sure we would, we would be clean, clean, right? <laughs> Lysol just getting sprayed on. And, and then as soon as quarantine started, I mean, we didn't know how to react and we weren't used this is the first time we ever been in quarantine so we we wanted to go out and we were like oh it's closed oh we're not allowed out we we need to be careful there was much more law enforcement out here making sure that we're only out doing like going out for essential essential errands and other than that i think it was pretty good i mean i it actually gave me time to relax a little bit but also not relax because knowing that this virus can do so much damage to you and your family it's crazy During quarantine, was anyone in your family required to work? Why were they considered essential? How work work conditions like during this time? How did you manage to disinfect your home and so after returning from work? So in my household, uh, all of us work except for my little brother, my little sister, and my mom. Everybody else, we go to work. At the beginning of quarantine, when COVID became like a big deal, I was working at Panda Express and then I quit after like a good few months, I would have to say. But I am currently working in landscaping and my mom just told us that we, we're still gonna have to keep working because the bills are still gonna keep piling up. And I'm like, that's true, that was, that was true. So we, we all currently work, but when we would come home, we would always like, like I said, we have to take all of our, like, not our clothes off, right, but, like, our boots off, and we would have to hand sanitizer, Lysol, Lysol, even more Lysol. I would get sprayed on, like, a good four times a day, 
And my mom would just stay home, like trying to disinfect everything in the house with everything she she can, she could buy at Walmart because everybody was already buying all the alcohol, the life school. It was it was a pretty rough, rough start, but we got her way through it. Did you and your family face any financial hardships during the pandemic? And if so, how did you all cope? Any financial problems, yes, because since every since hours were getting cut, like I remember I would I would be working like 34, 35 hours a pound, and then we would be getting cut to like 20 hours. And I mean, we would also have payments like for the house, we would for rent, we're renting, right? We paid like 500 and I would have my car payment to 300 And sometimes we didn't have money, so we would have to stop. We, this was actually a good and a bad for us because it taught us how to, how to save our money and actually choose what's important and what's not so we can see how much we actually spend on, on stuff we don't need. But yeah, we did have some problems and we had to let some of the, some of our, um, how could I say it? Some of our, what's the words? It's on the tip of my tongue, but. <laughs> Um, so showed us how to save. I'm just gonna say save. I'm gonna go with the word save. It showed us how to save money and save everything else that's important to us. How did your family feel about risking your lives and the health rather than to have bills piling up? I mean, my mom. My mom would always tell us to be careful. Be careful sanitize they say be careful but i mean we we knew it was a risk but we couldn't we couldn't just keep these bills piling up and we there wasn't gonna be any yeah there were stimulus checks but those weren't enough for the bills those are only enough for like food for our family so we knew we knew what we were getting ourselves into thank god everything's good right now at the moment as mentioned in our pre-interview, half your family suffered from COVID-19 during the summer. Did multiple family members get sick all at once or over a longer period of time? Uh, at first, it started off with my mom. <laughs> my mom was the first one to get it. She was the unlucky one. And other after that, it was like a few, give it two days, three days later when my little brother started getting sick. And then, like, another two days later passed, and my little sister started feeling sick. So it was, like, during – it would be um, long. Like, it would be, like, a two-day period. I was, I was surprisingly the only one who didn't get it, which was a big surprise to me because I usually get sick first. But, yeah, I think the only ones who didn't get it were me and my cousin. Me and my cousin, we were the only two who didn't get it out of the other family members. How was it getting a COVID test over the summer of 2020 like? Can you share me? <laughs> can you share with me some memories of your family's experiences getting tested? I mean, as you can see online, also they make fun of how the testing is. They stick this big cotton swab up your nose. And oh, they try to poke your brain out, or I don't know what they're trying to do, but oh no, it's so, it's the worst. So far, it's one of the worst feelings I've ever experienced because that thing is like a pretty good height amount. They just put it inside your nose and they just have it there swabbing for like a good five to 10 seconds. And you just want them to pull it out and they never do. And it's, uh, I remember I had a sneeze and I tried holding it in, and I oh, know. It's just a big mess. <laughs> Can you share with me, um, with me, what it was like having multiple family members in the same household sick? Were some not as sick as others? Yeah, some were not sick as others. I mean, my, I think the one who got it worse would have to be my little brother, because he would say that he he was super hungry, but he would eat something. And he would throw it up, or he would say it had no flavor. He he was the one who probably got it worse from us. But I mean, you could totally tell like everybody felt sick just by the energy they gave. Like they would get out the rooms, and you would say like, 
what's up? And they would just look at you and, like, no, you could tell from their eyes that they're tired or they feel bad. But, yeah, I would have to see them a little brother. Probably got to the worst out of all of us. Can you describe what it was like when the last family member to have COVID get well and beat the disease? It was, it was, it was a good moment because we we're, we were just waiting on the results. Like it, was, it had us anxious. All of us just there waiting, waiting until we finally got like the, the one message saying that we can go to like the doctor to pick up the results. And I mean, we were just happy. We honestly, we just thank God that everybody was like, all uh, good and well. Many people decided to self-isolate when they got a positive test. How did the dynamic work in your house when it came to taking medications to make those affected better and when it came to eating dinner? I mean, in my, in my house, it's like if one of us gets it, we all get it. So whatever, one per, whatever, like, since my mom got it first, whatever she was taking, we all had to take. So just so we can prevent it, <laughs> from prevent us from getting it. So it would be the same. Whatever my mom would eat, like, to, because they would always say, like, if you would eat this, it would help you, like, prevent it or it would help you get away, and, like, cure you. So whatever she would eat, we would have to eat it so she wouldn't be feeling left alone or she wouldn't be discouraged. But she would also tell us, like, it's up for our own, our own good, our own well-being because... Like, it might prevent us from getting it, but I mean, we never know. We never know. And, but yeah, other than that, we would still do everything together. We would still be there supporting each other because I mean, this is, I mean, we know it was, it was a risky virus, a scary virus, but we still tried to be in there supporting each other. Like, it's going to be okay. We're going to be fine. And we got through it. Right now, we're doing a lot better. How did you manage to handle the anxieties that everyone faced during these hard times, especially when a loved one was the one being targeted by the coronavirus? At first it felt unreal because, I mean, your mom just tells you that she has the coronavirus. He tried, he tried, I mean, you heard, you heard everything bad about it and you're like, okay, I'm gonna start washing my hands. I'm gonna start keeping safe, wearing a face mask. And you get home, and just for, for you to hear the news that your mom has coronavirus. And I mean, that, that just brings you down like by a whole lot. What, what else can you do other than like, oh, give her positive support that it's gonna be okay, that we're gonna be fine, don't worry. But I mean, in our household, our, our mother is like, she's the main, our main um, person. She keeps us together mostly. I mean, yeah, we like our dad, but we, we like whatever my mom wants, my mom gets me. Whatever my mom says, it's done also. Like, yes. But, yeah, when we heard that, like, we were that same day, like, me and my brothers, we were all trying to think of a way, like, what if we do this? What do we do this? We, it was, we could tell that we were all just, like, stressing about it. But, I mean, I'm not, there would be some times when I would be in my room. I would, I would cry. I'm not going to, I would be crying sometimes. I would be crying because it would be scary. It's some scary times knowing that this disease could take away a loved one and more when that loved one is your mom. That's why it's, it was, it was pretty hard. Did you ever fear getting the virus as well? Please explain why or why not. I did fear getting the virus because I mean, in my, <laughs> In my household, I'm the one to get sick the easiest that I have my tonsils. I get sick easier. But I, if at that point, I wasn't, I was more scared for my mom. I wasn't scared like of me. I knew like if I were to get it, I had a better chance of surviving than, than what, what my mom or dad, if they were to get it. But it would be a risk that we, that me and my brothers decided to take that we would start working a little bit more just so they don't have to, just so. They don't have to be stressing about um, paying the bills. We, we're helping them a little bit more. So we, we all took initiative in, in um, working. We knew the risk that it would bring, that it would bring but we, we, at the moment, we didn't care. Was it financially hard when everyone in your household had to self-quarantine during these two weeks? 
financially hard? No. If anything, it helped. It, it really did help us because it limited uh, us on getting what we need and uh, us spending like on chips, sodas, and all that. It really did help us learn how to save money and how to appreciate everything we have. Quarantine for your family and did a day before your birthday. How did you celebrate turning 21 during a pandemic while si simultaneously celebrating that your fi family was finally in the clear? We, for my birthday, I actually had plans to go, to go out of like state. But when, when COVID hit, we all had to go quarantine and um, traveling was, was not, not allowed. So we, I had to spend it at home, I believe, if I'm correct. If I remember, I forget easily. But <laughs> I, all I know is that I spent it here. I mean, we weren't able to do much, right? And, but uh, the only good thing is that we were all like COVID free. <laughs> That's good to hear. Speaking of family traditions and holidays, can you share with me how the pandemic impacted your family celebration of Thanksgiving or Christmas? It's, I would have to say, it, it drew some people away but it also brought us closer to other people. Because I know right now, our fam my family isn't having like the best issues with other family members. But I mean, we're, we got closer to other people that we now consider as family because they helped us as much. So if it brought us closer. It brought us closer to other people that we actually didn't think we'd call them family. But it also, this uh, virus has also led us to do some people. But uh, at the moment, we're we're happy with the people we have right now in our lives. Did you attend any quinceañeras, graduations, weddings, or funerals during the pandemic? If so, how were these celebrations impacted? Yes, I did go to a baby shower too. I went to a baby shower in the quinceañera. The quinceañera, it was it was limited people only though it, uh, it wasn't that many people and for the baby shower we actually had to drive we had to drive into like the edge of the house drop off the gift had to pick up the food they have they had for us and they just took a picture of us and they just asked for our names so they can say like we dropped it off in behalf of our names but i have never been to like a baby shower like uh, ever just go on the side of a road and just give a gift get food and leave it was basically like a drive through it was pretty pretty cool interesting two of your siblings are still in school how was remote learning for them were they able to grasp the material that was being taught to them or did they see this as having more time on their hands due to the pandemic having everyone stay at home They think, uh, I think, I'm sorry, I think that they have it a little bit more easier. Well, as so far from what my little brother has told me, because I would notice that when he would be going to school, he would come home stressed, like super stressed, telling me that he was, he was, he didn't know if he could be able to like handle the classes or to even like finish some assignments. But now that when quarantine started, like, I see him more relaxed. I see him smiling a little bit more. Yeah, he does have more time in his hands, but sometimes, but this also can be like a bad thing because sometimes he's like, oh, I need help and I can't, the teacher doesn't have Wi-Fi, so like I can't, I can't ask him for help or I can't submit this assignment because our Wi-Fi is down. But other than that, I, I think they think they see this as more, they have a little bit more time on their hands and they're not stressing as much. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next section, which does talk about when you worked at Panda Express and how you witnessed people panic buying in the RGV. Okay. 
<laughs> just for a little background, how long had you worked for Pent Express pre-pandemic? I was with the company for three years. As a fast food worker in the small city of Palmerhurst, Texas, what was it like seeing HEB and Walmart full as people were panic buying for quarantine? Do you think this was necessary? It's, uh, I don't think, <laughs> no, it was not necessary. This was totally, it was totally not necessary to, to everybody buy everything from the grocery store, buy toilet paper, buy water, buy the whole milk. It was like, I, I'm still to this day, I remember, because when I would work at Panda, we would have to go prep like at seven in the morning. But I wanted to finish early, so I remember waking up a little bit earlier, and I would be like, I'll get there 6.30 so I can get out earlier. As soon as I'm getting there 6.30, there was, there was already a line at HEB from the doors all the way to where almost, there's another placita next to it called, where, like, Ross, Forever 21 is at. The line was already there, and it was just 6.30 in the morning. And I was like, what is going on? And I'm like, what if Walmart's the same? And so I, I was super curious that I drive straight towards Walmart and there was a line just as long as that and I didn't I couldn't believe that people were actually gonna getting online buying an abundant amount of food toilet paper and just taking it home and they could just have it there it's crazy it was crazy and then it would also impact those when we're getting panda by creating those long lines since since all the food was taking Everybody would have to depend on the fast food, on fast food, fast food. Like, oh, it's ready, and they should have it fast. And no, uh, that was that just brought us even more stress at work. Okay, adding on to that, how did this impact business, as you just mentioned right now? Was it busier than usual? Yeah, it was totally busier. I remember we would make sales, we would be making like, five grand, six grand a day. We'd be one of the slowest stores ever. And then like, as soon as COVID hit and quarantine started, those sales would go like super, they went high, high. they went up to like 8,000, 7,000. It was, it was crazy. We weren't expecting that. We were expecting everybody to stay home, to cook at home or to at least like be with their loved ones. But it, it's like if they made them want to buy even more food and it made people even more aggressive, aggressive, like more aggressive, I'm sorry. Um, because every everybody was just so like scared and under a lot of stress because of how this pandemic hit us, and they just wanted to start arguments and just like wanted more food or either like we they thought we were toxic and rude and they just they were just looking for an argument. It was either they were having a bad day or just looking for an argument, and that totally put a big big amount of stress on us. When we would always have to be like the customers always right, and we always have to treat the customers nice. And we we tried our best, but there would be some moments where they would like push us to to the edge, and we wanted to see something, but we we kept it all together. We kept it composed. Yeah, it was it was just a big big mess. Okay, because of that, many fast food joints spoke out about being short staffed throughout the chaos that was the beginning of the pandemic. Did this affect the establishment at all in your area? At first, yes. At first, everybody was so scared of the of the virus that they all wanted to take safety procedures and be like, I'm not working anymore. I would like to use my sick hours. I would like to use this. I would like to use this. And at first, I was thinking the same thing. But then I was like, those sick hours are going to get us to like so much, like up to two weeks. After two weeks, we're not going to get paid anymore. We're not going to get helped by anybody. So yeah, we, there would be days when I still remember when our manager told us, like, if you don't want to work due to, like, the, the virus, like, you don't have to, but to other people that are going to work, like, it is going to be a risk for us. And we knew what we were doing. We knew that we still had to pay our bills. We still had to make money to support our family. Um, and then, like, after a while, you kind of realized it when those things, people that asked for those days off and those sick hours, when they would be like, oh, they showed up right to work. And they would be like, oh, I need more hours. Oh, I need more hours. But it, it was only so much that we can do. You were a cook at the time. How was the transition from having to work drive through and lobby to just taking drive through orders? 
How did these long lines of people affect your working environment? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Of course. You were a cook at the time. How was the transition from having to work drive through and lobby to just taking drive through orders? How did these long lines of people affect your working environment? Uh, it, it showed me to have more patience. <laughs> It showed me to have more patience and to, it actually like let me observe in what kind of place we live in. We have people freaking out over here and they just like taking it out on fast food workers sometimes, like all of the frustration and anger. And we, we observe it, we, we notice it, but uh, it just, sometimes it helps us build patience. And I mean, other times it just catches at a bad moment and it breaks our patience. But it was, if anything, it, yeah, it showed me how to be more patient, how it made me want to help these people even more just so they could have a good day or try to make them have a good day because there's no way that you could always just be going, having a bad day, having a bad day. And then, you know, I would at least, like, at least try making somebody smile, make them laugh, like, oh, try to joke around with them. But these people, there would be some people that just weren't in the mood for it or just, like, like, no, they were just really, really mad. And you just can't help everyone, I guess. But, I mean, you could always just try your best. That's what I took from all of this. I could always just try my best. It actually helped me build patience. And that's all it would be. <laughs> that's all I could think of. At any point during the chaos, did you feel like you wanted to walk out? Since not only was the job 10 times harder, but also because you were exposing yourself. There were so many, so many times that I wanted to walk out from that job. Uh, but mainly because there would be people like um, arguing over the food or arguing over the prices of the food or them just wanting to start an argument over whatever. Like if we answered, if we said like one wrong, one wrong word, they would take it as offensive. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was that line, that line, <laughs> we had to put cones in order to direct the line because it would get so crazy. We would have it blocking traffic. I remember that the cops had to get involved one time because we were blocking traffic with Chick-fil-A and McDonald's. Like the line was just too long. So we had to buy cones and we had to make them form a line and we had to keep that line in, in check because sometimes cars would move the cones and they would cut the lines and like they would they would send us to fix the cones and I, I remember this one time I told my manager his name was Ernesto at the time I told my manager Ernesto I'm not gonna go outside and get run over because these people are going crazy for food like no these people are going crazy over here I'm not gonna go outside try try to tell somebody not to cut in line and then get mad and just having one bad day road rage and just run me over no like yeah we would be risky <laughs> it would be risky because these these customers also we don't know what they might pull off. We've seen the craziest things in the cameras. Like we've seen customers cut off other customers. We've seen them get off in cars and argue. It's we've seen the cops get involved sometimes there too with two customers arguing. It, we don't know what might happen. We also had to take the safety procedure. I remember working over here in Sherry in another panda. The manager told me we had to have this meeting and how to deal with customers because they don't know how we they might react when we tell them that they're not allowed to come in without a mask. They literally told us if they have a weapon or a gun, like don't play the hero, give them what they want. It's just like, we don't know, that's it. Like we don't know what these they're capable of doing anymore. So it was risky, it was risky at the time. And we knew what we were getting ourselves into, but we, we just have to, I guess, take chances. If you feel comfortable talking about it, what was your salary like pre-pandemic and when the pandemic hit? Was it more or did it stay the same? Uh, it would have to be. If anything, right now at the moment, I, I'm, I'm kind of making what I lost because I was un, unemployed for like a good two months, a month. So I'm trying to make up with what I lost from there. But right now, as I see, uh, we're barely starting to come back. At first, we were, we, were, we were pretty low. We are pretty low, but we're starting to come back. Everybody's starting to 
try to help everybody out and we're starting to encounter more. Starting, but we're right now I'm 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 making decent. I'm not gonna say I'm making a lot, I'm making less, I'm making decent, I'm making enough for me to survive and to help out who I have to help out. Did Panda Express offer any types of health care to its employees? Do you think this helped the employees feel safer while working? Why or why not? <laughs> uh, Panda Express offered a raise only. They only offered a raise and it was of a dollar or two dollars, I believe. But they offered a raise and other than that, they would say, if you're feeling sick, just call in. Don't even take the chances. If you feel like you're getting a fever, call in. I tell your manager, let your manager know. But that would, other than that, that would be it. They would, they would enforce us to wear um, a mask while cooking, while taking orders. Uh, they would wear gloves. They would make us change our gloves every like three minutes, wash our hands every like five minutes. Like it would be just some crazy, crazy procedures that we'd have to follow and then but it would be like oh we only got like a dollar raise or 50 cent sometimes it would give us like 50 cent raise dollar raise it would all depend to who it would give it to moving on to your current job in landscaping after numerous months of working at a place that could potentially put you at risk of having covid you now work with a landscaping company can you please describe your new job and what to a typical day of work involves? Uh, my job as a landscaper is making sure that your irrigation system is working, making sure there's no leaks, there's no um, pipes that are bursted or any of your drip is broken or leaking. We also do some um, irrigation. We can cut your yarn, your, your, your yard, I'm sorry. Um, we could, we could plant. Uh, palm trees, plants. We can remove gravel. We can put mold. Basically, we we fix up your yards. We we also do big projects like uh, parks. I know in McAllen we did we have a the middle school the Leon soccer complex or park recreational park complex. It has like a total of like four fields plus the school field. We did that when there was no grass and. Though those would be, have to be the hard ones, I would have to say. Those are usually the ones we get the new systems when there's nothing. So we have to basically make our own like perincha. Perincha is like a little um uh uh we'd have to dig like a certain amount of feet into the ground. Right now we go like a good five feet, but for those big, big parts, we'd have to go like a whole ten feet down with the machine, and we'd have to use those four inch pipes to connect everything but i mean that's what mainly my job consists of making sure that uh, your system is working there's no leaks there's everything you're happy with what you have all right what changes do you see in your working environment from your previous jobs i'm sorry can you repeat that what changes do you see in your working environment right now than from your previous jobs Like, changes. I'm sorry, like what's the I'm difference sorry. between your current job and like Panda Express? <laughs> the only thing I miss from Panda Express that I'm not gonna lie is the air conditioning. <laughs> Cause right now it's some crazy hot days. I know right now we are like at 104, uh, but that would be the only thing. Other than that, I mean, it's the same thing. I see it as the same thing over here working in, in irrigation. I mean, you're with a customer. You gotta make sure the customer is happy, is satisfied with what you sell them. If they're happy, you're happy. You won't have any problems. Um, that, that's the way I see. I see it. Uh, the only thing is that we we are obviously under the sun, and there's if we're lucky, we do have shade with trees. But sometimes there is no trees, and we just have to in the truck. But that would be the only only changes that I would see because I still try to treat everybody like with like try to make them happy try to at least have a good conversation with them try to see how they're doing at least but those would be the only big dramatic changes and apart from working with multiple amount of people I'm only I only work with like one or two other people
do you think that you are safer working in an environment that is mostly outside rather than being in an enclosed space? Safer, I, I honestly feel, I mean, I feel the same because I would always, I see when I would work at Panda, I would always think like the bad things that could happen. Like obviously we work with oil, so I would be like, try not to get burned with oil, try not to get burned with the fire, with the flame, with the chemicals. Over here, it's basically the same thing. Like try not, our, our main, main issue, main issue is try not to get a heat stroke. Like try not to get a heat stroke, try, try to, to um, drink a lot of water, Try to stay focused, try to stay focused because right now with this heat, like it's it's crazy. It's so crazy. You drink like a whole gallon of water and you still feel like you're dehydrating. But um yeah, right. Also, um, we would also have to be careful with um not in not making sure we invade private property or making sure that we're allowed to go inside like the property of the owners because. Sometimes the owners don't realize that they have their own controls inside like the garage, but we we ask them in a nice way, but they just assume that we're trying to get in the property. I know I had one one guy argue with me, try, trying to convince me that I was trying to steal his bike inside his garage when I was only trying to do my job. And I also informed them that his remote was inside and that if I could take a look at it, he told me yes. But he was super convinced that I was trying to steal his bike and it's just no it's just crazy but you never know what might happen the main problem that we might that we have is like careful not to get a heat stroke if you feel like you you can't go on like it's okay we're not gonna get mad at you it's it's safety procedure we want to take care of you like we want to finish the job right but i mean what good is that gonna be if we only have one guy and the other guy is already like dying we, we want to make sure you're safe Do you prefer to wear a mask if you are driving with other crew members as you go from job to job? Why or why not? Honestly, honestly, like since uh, we work like in a, in a family company, like we only bring two other guys from a different, from a different household. But those two guys, we know them since we were younger kids. So we, we we trust them right though other than that we don't trust anybody else they're in the car with us we we make an exception because since we work in the sun and sometimes we finish a job we go to another job and the trucks don't have air sometimes so i'm not gonna force them to wear a mask knowing that we're working outside like in this 90 90 to 100 degree weather and then getting inside a hot truck that's been parked outside in the sun and tell them to wear a mask it's no it's basically killing them i don't know we, we we let them not wear the mask, but they still know, like, if we get off to in the house, we take off our mask, we wear our mask into the job site until we see that everybody goes inside. Then, yeah, we take it off, obviously, because we're going to die outside like that. How is life right now that COVID-19 cases have been lowered and you can now go to many places more freely? I I'm seeing it as a bad thing because everybody's starting to feel normal. Even though this virus is still out there, they're starting to see it as if as if it's nothing anymore, as if this virus hasn't done anything to us. Like um at first everybody was so was so scared that nobody was in the roads and now it's like everybody wants to be on the road. Clubs are opening up when I don't think they should be opening up knowing that that these cases have been going up. And then in a club, it's like, how are you supposed to have six feet apart when you know in the club everybody goes to have fun, to to mess around? And it's it's just it's no, I I I just think that we we still need to take this seriously and not not take it too too lightly. Too lightly. Light. I mean, <laughs> well, too. I mean, <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. My my. <laughs> I just came back from work and I'm like, fried out. 
It's fine. All right. Are you planning on getting the new COVID-19 vaccines that have been released recently? I like I've mentioned, I don't I'm it's a I'm contemplating on it because if it works, well, if it works, but if it doesn't, that's just a big toll on me. Because it might you don't know what how it might affect me. So right now at the moment, I am still deciding on it. Uh, in the end, I might just leave it to a coin toss. I mean, who knows? It's pretty, we, we don't know what might happen. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking that I probably will get it if I hear that it's like 100%, 99.9% sure that it'll work, it'll cure, or it'll, it'll prevent you. But other than that, I'm, right now, I'm thinking of not getting it, not risking it. Now to close, I'll ask you some final questions. Okay. Are you satisfied with the local response of COVID-19 in Mission, Texas? Oh, satisfied? I mean, we could do a lot more. We could we could really do a lot more, but we could only, it's, it's the people that need to do a lot more to, if we want to change, like we all have to put apart in order for, for the change to actually happen. Like, yes, we have these uh, wear mask sign, wash your hands sign. We have all of these, but I mean, <laughs> right now we walk past by them like there's nothing anymore. I, I, I just think that we all have to play a part and do our part. So in order for this to actually work, I mean, honestly, I really do think like in a year, if we were all doing our part, like how we were in the beginning, we would have been done. We would have been like this, this virus would have been like over. But right now everybody's taking it lightly. Like in spring break, we had people actually going to the island. That was like a COVID hotspot. It was, and people actually went, that's just showing you how many people there still is that are not following or not you know, enforcing the procedures. But I really do think like we should try to do more as a community to to try to enforce it. But right now, like I mean, yeah, as I'm saying, like we see the signs, but we we just say this. We all say the same thing. Oh, we know. Like we we know, and we roll our eyes, and we just walk past it. Are you satisfied with the state response of COVID-19 led by Greg Abbott in Texas? I am not satisfied. I really, I really don't know if he knows how, how many people it has. I mean, I know he knows, right? He has the numbers. He has, I just don't know what's going on in his head. Like he sees all of us. He, see, he saw how it, it impacted us. Like, he saw all the stories running out of food, running out of everything. And he, like a year later, right now, he says that we're fine wearing without masks. What in the world? No, we're not even, like, we're not even 100% that this shot is even capable of working. And he wants us to take off our mask already and saying that we're good to go. We're in the green light. I don't, I don't know what logic or what, what he saw that I didn't see, but it's pretty... Uh, it's pretty unreal to me. Are you satisfied with the current national response of COVID-19 led by President Biden and his administration? I mean, he's, he's, uh, no comment, no comment. <laughs> If you had the power to respond to COVID-19 with policies, laws, or workplace decisions, what would you do differently, if anything? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Of course, if you, if you had the power to respond to COVID-19 with policies, laws, or workplace decisions, what would you do differently, if anything? For example, if you were the one to be making the laws, for the state, how would you um, make it so that less people get contacted? Uh, 
That's the big question. That's if ah uh, if I could come up with that. I mean, I'm pretty much sure they could come up with it. And but at the moment, I really don't know what we can do because it's the same same thing over and over again. We will follow it. We'll follow it for like a good week or two, but after that, it's gonna slowly be broken down into not following in it, into not following it, into getting a little bit leverage and doing going out. Uh, being able to stay because I know we had a curfew at once until 11 right now we like right now it's like oh like the curfew just didn't exist like it's gone it's I I really don't know we can enforce I mean law enforcement but what good is that gonna do is just gonna put more stress on us seeing more law enforcement on the streets Are there any other stories or experiences you would like to share with me that I have not asked about? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I really don't think so. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for participating in the UTRGV Voices Oral History Project. It was really a pleasure getting to know your story about how COVID-19 impacted your life. I really appreciate you for allowing your story to be heard and saved for future generations. Thank you. Thank you.